<laughs> I'm good. I bought I bought one just about a couple. All of right. Hours. Welcome to Sticks and Sips. I am Frankie Drinks, and I welcome you to the Drew Estate Virtual Happy Hour. This is our big episode nine. Uh, guys, you've been waiting on this episode. I've been waiting on this episode for a long, long time. Uh, you know, we're, we're glad to have you. So first of all, like anything else, check in from your neighborhoods. I love to see that on the chat. So go ahead and check in. As you know, this is the big Drew Estate virtual happy hour where we have uh, our spirit guests. We have our sticks guests. We have uh, Joey. That's always part of what we do. And uh, we're so happy that you guys are with us yet again. And what can I tell you, man? This is a monster, monster episode. And I don't, you know, I, I, I use that term monster because uh, we'll be talking about something really special in a minute. So this is a big, big happy hour. So listen, all you got to do as you're watching, make sure that you hashtag Ask Frankie Drinks or ask any of our guests. And you guys get a little swag pack, a little, little cutter, a little hat. And uh, we'll get your, your swag out there for those five questions we, ch we choose at the end of the episode. So get your questions in. Uh, we've got so much great information. But listen, what's a happy hour without a happy hour menu? So I'm going to ask uh, my man Jack to throw it up. Listen, the big sip for today is our Ardbeg Wee Beastie. Uh, our stick for today is a Kentucky Fire Cured Flying Pig. And we have some amazing guests. We got Cameron George, National Ambassador for Ardbeg. We've got Chris Brower from Drew Estate. And we've got Chris Gwaltney from ABC, The Human Door, uh, with us. And we have an amazing cocktail for you. Because what's a happy hour without a cocktail? And we got something called the Bloody Rob Roy. And I got something super special because our special guest, Cameron George, is a star of this episode. So I'm going to I'm gonna ask you guys, I'm going to ask uh, our production to roll that beautiful footage. So uh, guys, are we ready? Let's do it. Through the mist flies a frightening surprise. Dormant by day, alive at aperitif time. A smoke-filled creature that'll have you running for cover. The Dram from the Red Lagoon. Its star is a monster of a dram. We Beastie lures with rich complexity. Its smokiness is its trap. Coating classic cocktails with heinously good flavors. See it showcase the rousingly good Rob Roy like never before. Impossible to suppress, the bloody Rob Roy is unleashed for the most inquisitive of taste buds. The bloody Rob Roy, appearing near you. Certificate X. Right, so you guys, you guys got this beautiful recipe for a bloody Rob Roy by our first guest, Cameron George. And if uh, if you didn't get all the ingredients, I'm gonna ask Jack to throw them up. It's a beautiful rendition of a Rob Roy, two ounces. I tweaked some things, Cam, so please don't get mad. As two ounces of Wee Beastie, an ounce of sweet vermouth, a couple of dashes of Angostura bitter, some orange zest, and a cherry on there. And all you got to do is combine all these ingredients, stir it to temp, get the right dilution. You want a beautiful coupe glass. You want it nice and chilled. And then you want to strain it on there and, uh, and adorn it with a beautiful cherry with that orange zest expression. And uh, with that... Listen, you guys got an amazing happy hour cocktail. What an amazing video. And uh, I'm going to say cheers to everybody out there. So raise your glasses with us. Super happy to. Oh, my God. That's just, uh, you know, Joey, this is money. Ooh. It's a money cocktail, man. Did, it's you a make money cocktail. One? Did, you make, did you make two of them? Sorry, brother. You know, I can only do one at a time. So listen, uh, first, I'm going to go into the Zoom and say hello to everybody. So I'm going to start with Chris Brower. Chris, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. How are you tonight? I'm doing awesome, man. Now that you're here, your big return to Sticks and Sips. It's been a while. And yes. uh, super honored to have you back. You know, when we were talking about doing Peter Whiskey, man, who's the first guy I thought about calling? It was you. Yeah. <laughs> I always appreciate it, man. I enjoy these uh these episodes, especially with the with the very PD uh Scotch whiskeys. So I appreciate you inviting me. Guess who was my number two invitee? 
Right here, baby. All right. My man, Chris Gwaltney from ABC Liquors in the Humidor. Uh, Chris Gwaltney, welcome back, man. How you doing? Good to be back, man. When you reached out, I was like, hey, Frankie's reaching out. I wonder which Isla Scotch they're doing on sips and or sticks and sips this week. I knew it. I knew it was coming, baby. I was excited about it. I love this particular one. It's one of my faves. The Wee Beastie. I, I can't wait to hear Cameron talk about it, but it, it's just wonderful, man. A, a five-year-old peat monster. I love it. Absolutely. And next, my man, my right hand. You know, he's my Robin to uh, to my to my stern. Uh, you know, uh, Joey, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good. I'm I'm just jealous of that cocktail. I might have to come over there and steal a swig out of that sucker. And you're always welcome, man. You're always welcome. And just to let you know, the bloody Rob Roy. You know, it's it's a riff on a Manhattan. Uh, you know, it goes back to like 1894ish, I think, and uh, Waldorf Astoria. Uh, you know, New York. So it's kind of rooted in that Manhattan template, uh, but just a beautiful expression of, of peated whiskey and sweet vermouth in that perfect balance, you know, and you can play around with it if you want to do, uh, you know, a little sweet and dry, you could. You can kind of play around with those uh, measurements as well. Uh, but I think this version, the way that Cam made it on that video was truly amazing. So, uh, so come by, man, I'll, I'll save you a little bit. All right. All right. And, and last but not least, you know, listen, before I get to my last uh, my last Zoom check in, I'm going to give him a little a little uh, little introduction. So, uh, you know, not only is he the national brand ambassador uh, for Ardbeg, uh, he also uh, is a, a very seasoned bartender in the world. So he's got an, a, an incredible breadth of experience and uh He's from the Pacific Northwest. These guys were leading the cocktail movement, uh, you know, real early on, early adopters, you know, and exploring flavors and, and, and profiles and, and cocktails and proper technique and, and delivering us something new. So I want to welcome uh, Cameron George to Six and Sips. Cameron, welcome. Thank you very, very much for having me. Super excited to be joining y'all. Uh, I cannot wait, cannot wait till uh, I can uh, get another one of those Rob Roy's into my hands. I guess the whiskey by itself is going to have to do for today, but, you know, being that this is a whiskey that's super near and dear to my heart, as with all the Ardbegs, uh, I'm just excited to be able to pour myself a dram and, and share it with you. So cheers and Salon Javad, let's have some fun. Salon Javad, so absolutely. So uh, listen, I'm gonna, give me give me a second. Oh, beautiful. Uh, give me a second as I you know, share this with everybody out there. You know, I frosted my glass. I, I made sure that that was oh, the beautiful way to uh, to enjoy this and truly is magical. Um, so Cameron, uh, first tell us a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a national ambassador and educator on behalf of Ardbeg here in the United States. Uh, I fell in love with this brand years, years before I accepted this position. In fact, this position was actually created for me. Um, I had the privilege of visiting Isla for the first time about six years ago, and I, I left part of my heart there. I had been to Scotland previously, um, you know, being, being here from the Pacific Northwest, uh, a lot of the, the flavors and a lot of the, the, se the seasonality, all of these things kind of resonated with me. Um, my, my first trip to Scotland when I was 11, I remember traveling around on, on you know, the Shetland Isles and and playing around and what I would actually find out on that trip was was a peat bog you know I remember getting all mucky and muddy and being like this mud is super cool and being corrected and, and told that this is peat um, and although I didn't learn or it didn't resonate with me at the time due to youth um, how important peat is to to sustainability and the lifeblood uh, of the country of Scotland um, it you know it, I did take with me that experience and so when I stepped into bartending uh, and I found peated whiskeys. I was like, Pete, oh, I know what that is. I know, I remember those aromatics. I remember the feel of it between my fingertips. And so it was easy for me to relate to a lot of the flavors um, and a lot of the aromatics that I experienced in a bottle of whiskey. And the romantic of me just, do, uh, you know, in me just dove head first into the category. And now, as you can see, I'm obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, l listen, I, I think, you know, the, the first time, you know, I've got my little like, you know, uh, I, I call it a, a, a peat curing barn here. 
uh, which, uh, you know, I've got like a little tiny bit of peat there that I burned out uh, mm -hmm. before and the it show reeks. started. And it, and reeks, it reeks too. It reeks. And man. it reeks. And when you, when you smell peat burning, um, that's, that's something you can never erase from your memory. It lives with you forever. And, uh, and, and that's truly magical. So, uh, Cameron, uh, tell us a story of Ardbeg. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as you were mentioning, peat is incredibly important to not only Ardbeg distillery, um, as we do make the most heavily peated whiskey in regular production, uh, but also peated whiskey and whiskey just in general. So here's actually a little picture of some peat that I may have I'm not going to admit to taking this. This was a gift from somebody. It was a gift from somebody on one of my trips to Isla, um, visiting the malting facility where Ardbeg sources all of its malted barley, which is in fact on Isla, um, the region and, and the island that we are born on. So Ardbeg Distillery, uh, it, its manifestation date or established date is 1815, but there are stories of illicit and illegal distillation that actually occur on the site that is called Arnhem Based or Home of the Beast. That's the name of the farm that Ardbeg Distillery actually sits on, or the name of the plot of land that Ardbeg Farm actually sits on. Uh, so even as far back as in like 1794, we know that there was active distillation happening on that southeastern side of the island of Isla. Um, Isla is, a, is an island in, in what's called the Hebridean Islands, a chain of islands off the southwest coast of Scotland. Um, basically, if you were to float on a raft off of Scotland, off the, off the southwest coast of Scotland, before floating out into Ireland and then out into the abyss, uh, before hitting you know, Manhattan and New York, uh, you would basically run directly into Isla or one of the other Hebridean Islands. This is really important geographically um, in terms of the, the migration of whiskey um, as a category, because we know that whiskey was, was established or created in Ireland, or that's the accepted belief, right, is that whiskey was created in Ireland. I think that Scotland is where whiskey was perfected. And there was a waypoint on the way before whiskey could settle down in, Scot in Scotland's heartland would have actually passed through the islands of Isla and Jura and some of the other Hebridean islands. So Isla is an incredibly important place to the people of Scotland. Uh, historically, it's been the high seat of power for um, the, the Lords of the Isles. Uh, it's also, um, you know, it, it also appears in a lot of the stories, uh, you know, like the Macbeth stories as well. Um, so it's, it, it's just an island that has an immense cultural relevance. And I think that when we're talking about whiskey, that needs to be spoken about. Ardbeg Distillery being the most highly awarded single malt whiskey distillery uh, in the last, what, 23 years since it rebooted in 1997. Uh, World Whiskey Distillery of the Year four times over uh, with the most decorated master, master distiller on the planet, Dr. Bill Lumsden as well. So an incredibly iconic uh, and wonderful distillery that is also just a magical place. Well, you know, listen, uh... Cam, uh, you gave the most beautiful, politically correct answer to where whiskey comes from, uh, because that's a big question uh, that happens a lot. So I appreciate your answer because it was quite beautiful in the way you placed it. Uh, I, I call the islands of Isla and Jura like the handshake moment right between places uh, where where the beauty of uh, sharing the, the knowledge of distillation and the evasion of the tax man, uh, you know, truly, truly happened. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's another conversation. But you said a very, very important person. You said Dr. Bill Lumsden. And uh, let's tell everybody about why this gentleman is so important in the world of whiskey. Absolutely. Yeah, I will also say that as I get a couple of drams in me, the political correctness is going to go out the window. So that's just... <laughs> Let's just start right there, right? Um, but, but, but Dr. Bill is, is absolutely incredible. He's a mentor. He is a thought leader. Um, he is, you know, one of the, the greatest, uh, you know, whiskey distillers and whiskey makers on the planet as well. Um, not only has, has he been, uh, you know, a master distiller and a master blender, he's, you know, a, a, uh, you know uh, essentially an engineer uh, by trade as well. 
um, his, his knowledge of organic science and, and the interaction of spirit and wood is second to none. Um, you know, he is, he is everything to the whiskey industry. Uh, you know, he is the mastermind and head of whiskey creation for not only Ardbeg, but also our sister, our larger but younger sister distillery, Glyn Morangy. Um, in between those two distilleries, he gets to experiment in two drastically different styles of whiskey that really bookend the entire kind of possible universe uh, of single malt Scotch whiskey. Um, you know, in, in that way, it, it's incredible because he gets to wake up and put on two different hats situationally when he's in Glen Morangy whiskey creation mode versus Ardbeg whiskey creation mode. And it, it's just awesome to see somebody who can shift gears uh, in the way that he can. He's somebody who describes himself as having an incredibly low boredom threshold. Um, so he's always gotta be working on something. Uh, I would describe him as somebody who is a genius um, that is a pain to go to dinner with uh, because he's going to just hit you over the head with knowledge and you're going to end up paying for some really expensive wine. So <laughs> there's that. that. Sounds like going to dinner with JD. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, exactly. you always, know, always seems to go to the bathroom right as that tab gets stopped. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Guess I'll, guess I'll be getting this this time again. Thank that's you. Abs you know, listen, listen, man, I've, I've been around enough brand ambassadors and, and you guys know the role, right? Your role mm -hmm. is when, when, when Dr. Bill comes to town, your credit card comes out, Absolutely. not his. Yeah, never, it's never. You and imagine me waiting for Doctor Bill to come back from the bathroom. Are we splitting this? You're fired. Get out of here. But it's all good because uh, listen, you come from a great, uh, the great LVMH family, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, wonderful brands that encompass that. And uh, listen, I, I don't want to wait any longer. I want to talk about, and I'm going to ask my man Jack to throw it up. Uh, the Ardbeg Wee Beastie. Um, let's talk about how beautiful this expression of Ardbeg is. And I know some people have had some experience with that Ardbeg tenure and, and different uh, different expressions, but Wee Beastie just caught, caught my eye, caught my attention, tasted it and said, this is what we need to talk about tonight. So uh, are, are you ready to talk about Wee Beastie? Absolutely. You know, I will say, let's go ahead and, and raise our glasses one more time. Just get another dram in us. These things just always go so much better when we're, when we're well lubricated. Next thing I know, you guys are going to be complimenting on how knowledgeable and eloquent I am, how handsome I am, how deep my waves are. Like, it, it's it just going to go so much better. So again, cheers. Slange, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Two out of three ain't bad. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do this. Right. There we go. Um, awesome. So, we Beastie. Um, we Beastie is a product that, that, that we just recently launched. It's actually the newest whiskey in Ardbeg's core range. Um, I'll hold the packaging up for everybody. Make sure we can get a nice little shot of that. Beautiful. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful, iconic packaging. I, I was a huge fan of it as soon as we saw it. Um, you know, it is also a whiskey that I had the, the privilege of, of being involved in creating with the whiskey creation team. Uh, I actually got to help decide the, the proof and then the makeup, um, the genetic makeup. And when I say that, I mean ex bourbon cask as well as some Oloroso sherry cask. Uh, so there was a, a blind tasting routine of 25 different whiskeys that, that they allowed me to take part in. Um, what we came up with was close to about 50% ex bourbon, 50% uh, Oloroso sherry cask at 47.4% alcohol by volume. Uh, it was an incredible experience to be involved in this. Uh, from the ground up, uh, I feel like I, I got to have a, a hand in creating um, a whiskey that has gone on to be the, uh, the most highly awarded whiskey under 10 years old. Uh, audaciously bottled in, in, you know, at five years old. Um, this is an age statemented whiskey that is supposed to take us from you know, wherever we're seated. For me, it's here in, in my office in Seattle, Washington, and immediately teleport us into the peat bog um, uh, of Isla where we hew our peat from. Um, the, malting process, uh, the malting process is where peat is infused in as, as a flavor um, into, into malted, in the malted barley and then into single malt scotch whiskey, right? Uh, it's actually at the end of that process. It's, it's the kilning. 
So during the kilning process for the first 16 hours, you're actually going to dry that malted barley with peat, right? I already showed it, but there's another shot of it. So it'll cover up my ugly mug. Right. So through the first 16 hours, you're imparting and you're infusing that, that smoke uh, into the malted barley. The reason that this happens through the first 16 hours is because that, that barley is still technically green, green barley. It's not been all the way malted. It's gone through germination, but it now needs to be dried. So what's happening is you're burning that peat and that peat is raising through the floor and it's coming up and it's in, attaching itself onto the outside of this still damp malted barley. What it's carrying with it is what we call phenol. And that's an incredibly important term in whiskey. You're gonna hear it mentioned all the time. I'm probably gonna say it 50 times tonight, right? Phenol, 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 phenol. So our big is searching for a phenolic range of, in our malted barley of 55 to 65 parts per million. So after the drying process, you're actually gonna lose these phenols because they're basically flavor crystals. They're gonna dry out and some of them are gonna fall off when you're transporting the malted barley. Some are gonna fall off when you're processing it into grist, grit, and husk and grinding it down. Some of it's gonna fall off uh, when, you're, when you're essentially making your, um, your, your wort. Some of it is gonna, you're gonna lose some of it during distillation and you're gonna lose a lot during maturation as well. So even though we're looking for a malted barley, a batch that's between 55 and 65 parts per million, post-process after 10 years in a cask and into our glass, that whiskey is gonna have a, a content of about 25 parts per million, maybe. So how do you cut out, you know, how do you, how do you gain some of that market share back, right? And that's actually by intentionally bottling peated whiskeys at a young age. Peated whiskey showcase youth beautifully. Some of my favorite whiskeys are young Ard Beggs, hence why I love Wee Beastie so much. So as we reduce that age statement and time down to five years, now what we're able to see is that there's less attrition of some of these phenols. So instead of being around 25 parts per million, Wee Beastie is probably around 28 or 29 in its, ca in its cask, but the ferocity of a lot of them, the activity of them is much more vibrant, right? So that's why when we dig, dig our noses into, us, into this, there's a lot of that chocolate cacao, there's a funkiness, there's a lactic element, like a creaminess to it as well. Black pepper, really beautiful savory, savory notes to it. Still some tar that I absolutely love in Ardbeg. I want my Ardbeg mucky. And so the sherry cask helps this. And then on the palate, beautiful, funky, woody, wet roots. Mm, again, that chocolate, that dark cacao, almost like baker's cacao. There's herbal or herbal notes as the Brits always, they always make fun of us here in the States. I, you know, I, I hate some of the people I work with. The, the Scots, <laughs> they make fun of us all the time. Anytime I'm over there, they always make fun of how I order food. I'm like, oh, I'll do the, oh, I'll do, I'll do. You're so American, Cameron. I'm like, don't make fun of me. Uh, you know, but one of the words that they always roast us on is, is herbal. They say that we pronounce it herbal, you know, that we drop the H. It's herbal. There should be a hard H right there. And I'm like, you sound ridiculous. So I'm going to keep saying it like herbal. Um, there's lapsang, souchong, wet moss, things like that that immediately come to the palate. And then don't forget that salinity. This is just a, an absolute Oof. stunner of a dram. Yeah. Yeah, we talked love it. Love earlier, it. man, about that on the nose that like, like you said, on the beach, someone's throwing, you know, salt water on the fire. It's got all of that on the nose. It's incredible. Absolutely, absolutely. By the way, no. for all the Scots out there, I'm gonna call it the New Ebrides, uh, <laughs> just you know to uh, to yeah. Americanize it, you know. So uh, so thank you uh, exactly. on that. But uh, you know, Chris and Chris, I'm gonna ask you guys, man, what are you what are you picking up on the aroma that uh, that's so amazing on, uh, especially uh, you know, I'll, I'll let Chris Brower go first because he's got a fresh pour, so he's gonna get it fresh. So uh, go in there, man. So, um, you know, you definitely pick up that, that peatiness, you know, the talk that, you know, this is a young whiskey, but, um, you know, I like pairing it with the uh, fire cure because it knocks back some of that smokiness and you definitely pick up more of those, uh, honey notes, the sweetness that's in, in, in this whiskey. So that's what I'm tasting right now and smelling. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. Uh, Chris, Bra Chris Gwaltney. Mr. Gwaltney. Mr. Gwaltney. I'm going to do something that I've 
rarely ever do in, in this life, and that's agree with Chris Brower. Um, you know, man, I, I think uh, I think he's right on. You know, you you get you do get Pete on the nose. Uh, you get that intense little intensity of the Pete on the front forward. But to me, um, your reward is that wonderful honey sweetness, and it just lingers on your palate. I mean, long after you. And if you really want to take it to the next level, as you swallow retro health through your nose, like you, and it's just going to, it's just going to stay there much longer. So, and, and I'm with Chris, I mean, you know, you know, Frankie, I'm an advocate. I'm, I'm about Isla uh, KFC. I don't even call it the KFC cigar anymore. I call this the IBC. It's the Isla bang stick because this thing was made for Isla scotch, bro. So I'm telling you next time I come down to Safari and I do a blend, I'm working on it in my head. I'm going to kick some more KFC filler in this sucker, and I want to make a super bang stick, Isla bang stick. And uh, I don't know, who knows, man? Maybe one day you'll be able to, you may be able to buy it at this place because I love there it. We there we go. There we go. Listen, great, um, the only thing I'm going to add to it, man, there, there's like when you combine when you combine the aroma and you combine um, – you know, the taste and, uh, on the palate as, as it washes through there, man, there is that, um, I'm going to call it uh steaky umami, right? Mm -hmm. That's this, like, if you just popped in this beautiful, like grilled freaking fresh steak and you got that little crust on there and, and that breaks through your palate and it, it kind of emulates that richness, man. Cause it feels so rich for being so young, Cam. It, it's so rich to me Absolutely. Uh, on the palate. You know, I was going to add to that uh, to a couple of things. For, first thing, Joey was absolutely right. Put some respect on Mr. Gwaltney's name. Look at his beard. It is Mr. <laughs> Gwaltney, first off, right? Let, let's, let's get that unanimously in check here. Um, but, but then I would also add that, that I, I'm in agreement with the reason that, that you want to call it, you know, call the stick the IBC, you know, the, the Isla Bang stick. Um, the I think that the mouthfeel of both of these things are, is there's a synergy to them. They they kind of they they resonate together. They under they understand each other. They're moving at the same frequency, um, you know. And, and Frank, you mentioned that the the texture. Uh, I think that drinking whiskey is an experience. Um, you know, it shouldn't only be about you know how it smells or how it tastes, but there's a, it, we should also discuss how it feels and how it makes us feel when we're drinking it as well. And so the textural component of, of Wee Beastie, how would we get a young whiskey to showcase such um, textural intensity, right? That rich, decadent, that softness, um, that, that almost like, like you, you hit the nail on the head, umami. There's another term that, that the French use in addition to terroir, which you know, we, we agreed was, sounds ridiculous. There's another ridiculous term that they, that they use, which is rancio, right? And it's supposed to be that like, sweetened honey barnyardy um you know kind of like funkiness and it actually when you think about it 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 makes sense i hate the term but i like all of the characteristics that it encompasses um and as far as you know how that would be imparted well those sherry casks are going to be european are going to be european oak the previous occupant um, is going to have an additive effect on the mouth, on the lipid kind of situation and the mouth feel, right? So Oloroso Sherry being part of the, you know, being the previous occupant of those European oak casks. Then also we know that European oak is much higher in tannins than it is in lip, than it is in lignin. So lignin is a component in, in American oak casks. That's why when we taste bourbons, we're like, oh, it's so smooth. It tastes like vanilla and it tastes like you know, creme brulee and all these other things. Well, like, let's buy design. It's they're using American oak casks that have a lot of lignin, and you sound stupid when you say something smooth. That's ridiculous. Let's get away from that term. Um, cheers, right? I'll raise a glass to <laughs> mid rant. To that. Listen, this, 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 stop for the descriptive of like, what's it taste like? It tastes smooth. It's exactly. fuck smooth. Yeah, that's like, it. I said it. Fuck smooth. Yeah, exactly. Cheers. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Joey. Right. You know, sometimes you want something to stick out. Sometimes mm -hmm. you want something to grab your attention. Exactly. And, that's what, and this is one of those things that grabs your attention. It's not made to be this big, balanced, creamy, you know, creme brulee and, and vanilla. No, mm -hmm. no, no. This is exactly. meant to, you know, wake, it wakes you up. You know, it makes you rambunctious. It makes you want to curse like a sailor. <laughs> and that's what we're going to do. 
there are there are five main flavors that we look for when we're putting together any ard bag, and those are going to be savory, herbal. I'll appease the Scots right there. Medicinal, woody, and then coal. And this carries forward all of them. Um, the herbal component, as I was going to say, comes from a lot of those tannins from the European oak. Uh, um, the, you know, that's where we get a lot of the, you know, a lot of that like creosote and salt and things like that. But the, a lot of the mouthfeel that's going to come from the previous occupant, the sherry, and also some of the fact that yes, because we're using some ex bourbon cast, some of those lignin kind of notes are going to be still in, intact as well, right? So this is just a very complex uh, and youthful whiskey. And who said older is better when it comes to whiskey. That's ridiculous. Get out of your own heads and start drinking some delicious young whiskey. <laughs> so listen, uh, the man has said phenols, lignins, uh, you know, what, you know, a, a third term that I forgot, you know, which half our audience has forgotten. So you have, you have to watch this episode all over again once we're done, but we're not done just yet. So, uh, uh, Cam, thank you for the incredible education. Uh, but there's something called Ardbeg Day. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. You know, I first off, I told you at the top of the segment. You know, we the reason I wanted us to get a dram into our into our faces almost immediately is because I knew you were going to think I was that much hand, more handsome, that much smarter. So it's by design. Like it's, it's, it's I'm a veteran at this, right? This is all by design. Um, so Ardbeg Day. Ardbeg Day is the day that we celebrate all things Ardbegian, as we would call it. Um, this brand has an immense amount of heritage. It has an immense amount of personality as well. Um, you know, during, essentially during uh, the, the last day in, uh, in May, there is a, a festival on Isla called the Fesh, the Fesh Isle or Fesh Isle, depending on who, who you have pronounce it for you. Um, this, this is a celebration of all things life and festivity on Isla. Um, this island has under 3,000 inhabitants that, that live on it full time. Uh, when you're driving around, you know, just a pro tip here, uh, you know, make sure that you raise your hand off the wheel and you wave at everybody as they're, move, as they're coming in the, the opposite direction um, from you, uh, or else they will call you a wanker under your breath, uh, under their breath. For sure, uh, it's called the Isla Wave. It's how everybody, you know, behaves on Isla. It's the friendliest place on Earth, next to Disneyland. I'll, I'll let them retain that title for sure. Um, anyway, so uh, you know, Ardbeg Day is the last day of the festival. Uh, this year, it actually it, it actually is on June first. Uh, we're going to be having a wonderful digital Ardbeg Day with lots of updates to come. So watch this space. If you want to find uh, any updates about it or you want to be privy to any updates, the best way to become, you know, the, the best and most true Ardbegian that you possibly can is to actually join the Ardbeg committee. So this committee was formed in 2000 and now it has over 500,000 um, loyal fans and, and just, just committed weirdos to the brand of which I am. I'm a weirdo for sure, for sure, for sure. Look at my whiskey collection. It's weird. Why, why do I need all this? Because I love it. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, join this, this band of weirdos. Join us, please. Join us at, at our digital Ardbeg Day. This is going to be one for the absolute ages. I'm super excited. Just got to, you know, to be involved in some of the brand plans. And I, I'm just incredibly excited about uh, this one in particular. Uh, it's it's going to be a wacky one. So I'm very excited. So you can go to so, so, uh so, uh, Jack, uh, I'm going to ask you to throw it in on the chat there. Uh, you know, if you want to join all the all the weirdos uh, mm -hmm. or aficionados, as, as I kindly like to call them, you know, uh, ardbeg.com and uh, and get on there. So June 1 is going to be a great, great day that you want to tune in. And, you know, we live in a different world, Cam, right? You know, you, you might be taking a visit down to South Florida. We might be hanging out. Uh, July, we would have probably been hanging out at Tales of the Cocktail, but this is a yeah. different year and uh, it's good. We're going to adapt and we're going to move forward. So um, I'm going to ask you uh, another question. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm just very glad that you said adapt and you didn't say pivot. If I heard one more person say pivot, I probably would have thrown my glass through my window here. I'm not going to lie. All right, lie. pivot you're oh muted. So, uh, you know, so um, I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with both those. So let's pivot now. You're muted. Uh, t tell, tell us about lesser told stories of Scottish black history. 
because this is something so cool that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, Scotland is is a country that has influenced the world around us in ways that that we can't even begin to comprehend. You know, we talk about the the home of modern you know geology. You know, we we want to talk about the contributions, the the global contributions to to, to shipping, um, and, and you know, in global comp and global commerce. Um, and, and part of these stories involve people of color and actually a lot more of them than we would have initially anticipated involve people of color uh, which i find absolutely fascinating um, so these stories are oftentimes you know not told and not shared with us um you know because they're not the, they're not the most popular they're not the brave heart everybody wants to see themselves represented as the hero of their own story and to do that you need to be uh, you need to see yourself reflected in in stories of of uh, of, cu of culture, um, you know. And so, for that reason, people haven't necessarily seen people of color uh, I involved in conversations and in, in stories, um, you know, in in Gaelic or Scottish history or heritage, um, you know. But they do exist, and through you know some investigative work, I was able to launch a pretty cool series. Um, you know, there, there are going to be a couple more episodes in it as well. Um, honestly, my favorite one was probably the, the Eugene Bullard. Uh, I'm the grandson of, of a Tuskegee Airman. So anything that involves, you know, uh, the, the contributions, um, you know, to, to the world of, of aeronautics, uh, you know, it means the world to me. Um, you know, so, so to see that there was a, a person of color that was kind of his story was swept under the rug and it happens to pass, you know, intersect with, uh, the story of a country that I love so, so deeply in, in Scotland, um, you know, it, I just, I had to tell these stories. So I was very happy to get to do that. So uh, tell, tell everyone where we could uh, kind of tune in. Absolutely. Please, please make sure you follow me um, on Instagram at ArdbegCam. Uh, the stories are posted directly on my IGTV. Um, if you want to get into some more weirdness, uh, I believe I have to post one more of them up on my Instagram. Um, but my Instagram, or sorry, my uh, my YouTube, but my YouTube is also our big cam. You can also see some some pretty interesting uh, things that I was doing called Whiskey Through Food as well, which talked about food pairing. And I'm getting to ready to launch a new series called Creatively Classic that studies uh, classic cocktails, just reimagined as a, um, you know, as Scotch whiskey cocktails, uh, and also highlights, um, you know, sneakers. I'm a huge sneaker head as well. So we're going to be talking about shoes and kicks a lot. That's, that's great, man. You, you, Kenny Jordan from Patron, all you guys are like freaking just sneaker pimps, you know, and, Absolutely. and, uh, and we love and respect it. And, uh, you listen, before I move on, we're going to talk about KFC in a second here. Uh, listen, you dropped an amazing haiku brother. You dropped uh -huh. an amazing haiku. Uh, you know, do you still recall it? Can you share it with us right before we move on? Oh man, how are you gonna put me on the spot like that? That's so mad. Uh, I I don't know, uh, man. Uh, just uh, look uh, up your right. just look up your IG. All right, you all know. right, all right, all right, all right. I'm on it. I'm on it. This last one that I did was actually really good. So let let's go. Um, let, let's go ahead and read this haiku. I just there's something so beautiful about like the simplicity of haikus, and when we talk about you know. Uh, when we talk about whiskeys, we often do it in, in terms of, um, you know, like tasting notes. And those tasting notes often, you know, begin with like the nose or, you know, the, and the palate and the finish. So generally we're working within a concept of like, you know, three descriptive boxes. And there's a synergy again to the format of haikus. Um, not that I'll always write my haikus in, in, to, to reflect nose uh, um, and palate and finish. This one in particular just is, is kind of about how I see the brand of Ardbeg. Uh, and I tried to put it as simply as I possibly could. So this one is called Ardbeg Arises and it's simply smoking peat, combustion consumes barley, Ardbeg Arises. Super simple, uh, but, but it is everything that I think about when, when I think about Ardbeg. Nice. It's not even well, just a, a haiku, it's a hairy coup. Right, yeah, love it. <laughs> So let's let, let's raise a glass, Cam. Uh, what an amazing, what an amazing experience to be with you and and to uh, with everybody out there. We'll, we'll wait on Chris Brower. Uh, he's got his pour finally in. 
I've got my Kentucky Fire Cure glass and, you know, and uh, and welcome all of you to enjoy it. Don't shoot it back. Uh, no, stay you gotta, below you gotta, to you it. You got to savor this sucker. You got to savor it. Not, and not unless you're Mr. Mr. Gwaltney, who's just chugging away here. Yeah, but, you know, he's already been through it. It's okay. We'll forgive him. And uh, I want to say thank you, uh, Cameron. <laughs> Uh, for cool. joining us and sharing this amazing thing, but don't go anywhere. Cause you know, listen, we're going to talk about our own version of we beastie, the monster dram, right. Uh, with my man, uh, Chris Gwaltney, uh, Chris, welcome back to sticks and sips. Glad to be back, brother. Glad to be back, man. So, you know, you, we've got the whiskey side already. So we're going to talk about the KFC and uh you know and, and and tell us your feeling on the kfc brother because i think this is like we talked about it early i think this is a great pairing for we beastie yeah first of all you can take that term vanilla and flush that shit down the toilet bro because there's nothing vanilla about this cigar yeah I always always um look i like bourbon i like all things i like all types of cigars i like all types of whiskeys all types of cocktails there's a time and place for everything but when people say something is smooth and vanilla, my first thought is when you go to one of those ice cream places that does all the mix-ins and all the different flavors, does anybody ever freaking order vanilla and walk out the door? No. So, so come on, vanilla has a place, but if you want to go on a really cool journey and you want to try some flavors that are just going to just hit your palate, you know, like a freaking sledgehammer, then you, you go with this scotch and you go with the KFC. I mean, this, this cigar, I'm actually having to get ready to light a second one. I've already went through one so far, but this cigar is no matter what Vitola you choose, you're going to get that wonderful smokiness that you get from those hard woods that are used in the, in the air curing barn to infuse that flavor, you know, and, and, and that's a huge no, no in the rest of the tobacco world. I mean, we know this, you've been to farms, everyone either uses natural uh, air curing processes, or if they need to heat the barn up, they're using propane heaters, what they call green fire, where they're not putting any flavor into the leaf. They're just heating it up, right? And when it comes to KFC, man, it's like it's like they're smoking like Boston butt, bro. I mean, they are, they got the pig in there. They're putting oak, hickory, maple wood, all the stuff that you're going to see that people are going to smoke meat with. That's what's infusing into that Kentucky fire cured leaf. And it doesn't take a lot of that leaf to make a cigar. And you would be shocked. I mean, there's not a lot of KFC blended into the, you know, this isn't a KFC puro. I've never smoked one. Um, I'm sure it would probably be way over the top. Maybe that'll be my IBC. My Isla Bank, st my Isla, uh, bank stick is going to be a, uh, you know, bank cigar is going to be a, maybe a, a puro of KFC. We'll see how that goes. But I just really think that, you know, people, it's a love-hate relationship with KFC. You guys know this at Drew Estate, right? People love KFC or they can't stand it. It's not like, mm, I kind of like it, you know? So I always, the, the kind of person that's going to like the KFC is the person who likes to experiment with food. They like to have, they like hot peppers, maybe. They like spicy food. They like, they like to try new stuff. And they like to, they're not this, the person that's going to drink the same whiskey and smoke the same cigar you know, and that's what they're going to do, right? They're not loyal to just one flavor profile. And I think the KFC is obviously unique. There's nothing else out there like it. And uh, I know it says Kentucky on it because that's the tobacco. But, um, you know, it's it's not just for bourbon, guys. I mean, this thing is made for Petey Scotch and Isla Scotch. And, you know, I'm like I said, man, it, I'm so glad you guys made this cigar. Uh, it's like when I love Petey Scotch and I, I love this cigar. I think it's absolutely amazing. I'll smoke this cigar with other things. I think um, um, with bourbon, it's good because I think it adds some contrast and it brings some power to the experience because the bourbon, you know, other whiskeys are going to be a little bit more muted and not as smoky as, as an Isla Scotch. But I absolutely, uh, when it comes time, when you find those two things that pair really well, right? Uh, this is this is like at the top of the page. I mean, these two were made for each other, and and I, I just it's it's amazing. And if you haven't tried it, um, if you're someone that's on the fence, I tried a KFC and I didn't like it. Well, you know, sometimes people drink full-bodied red wines and they're like, ah, it was too much for me. But if you have it with a 
a steak or a, a big meal, then it kind of kind of balances things out. I think if you have this with the PD scotch, I think the two are going to go really well together. And if you're on the fence on either one of those items, maybe you like the KFC and don't like PD scotch, or you like PD scotch, don't like KFC. Yeah, go to hell. (laughs) (laughs) Then you can go to hell. How about that? Yeah. Just all right. It, thank, thank you, Joey. I uh, <laughs> I knew where he was going. He was trying to. <laughs> I was trying to be a nice even. He was talk. trying to be politically correct. And, yeah, and you, you said, we're like, not having any of that shit. Yeah, if you don't, don't like the cigar, you don't like the whiskey, go to hell. You know. <laughs> but no, man. I mean, you know, I, I love this cigar. I think, I think it's great. Like I said, with a lot of different products, and it's great by itself because it's so unique and it's such a unique flavor. And it's not just the smokiness. I mean, there's a nice, rich earthiness to this cigar, you know. For people that like, I'm not comparing it to Ometepe tobacco, if you like Ometepe tobacco, but Ometepe tobacco from Nicaragua has a very earthiness to it. And once you get past the smoke, it's a lot of that same, you get some of that same earthiness, right? And and you, if you look at where this tobacco is grown and where Ometepe is grown, there could be no no similarities in in the soil composition, the climate or elevation or anything, right? But uh, this is absolutely spot on, uh, a, a great, unique cigar. And if you've tried it in the past and you didn't like it, I say try it again, because maybe, you know, you, you've grown up, you've got a little bit older and it's time for you to try grown folks stuff. Hey, Chris, you gave me a great idea. You said something earlier that's just, I, I can't wait to, we got to try it immediately. So in the Mescal world, they do these things called pachugas where they, they put like a, a piece of meat, a lamb or, or, or a turkey over the fermentation tanks while they're, while they're fermenting mezcal. And maybe we just roast a pig in the smoking barns with the hardwoods and see where that takes us. Because now, now we could be on, because then that would make a flying pig even more flying. Yeah, and more pig. And more oh, piggy. More pi- <laughs> or more piggy, right. A little more Absolutely. piggy. You can take so some look, of my I, I'm gonna take I'm gonna ask my, my man well. Jack here for to take a second here and throw up that beautiful like KFC. So everybody knows who we're really talking about. You know, we're talking about uh, you know uh, a Capa Negra, you know Mexican San Andres, uh, Kentucky Fire Cured wrapper, uh, Nicaraguan uh, binder, uh, Kentucky Fire Cured uh, and Nicaraguan filler. Uh, where we're making this beautiful beautiful presentation i'm having a uh, little delfina here uh for those of you guys that are connoisseurs because i can light this one up and, and let it go uh while i'm talking and uh it's just beautiful because it's just got like a lot just just that's that's all just wrapper you know so it's a lot of fun uh so i'm gonna go to chris brower uh chris um you know run us through a little bit of the process of making that kentucky fire cured we we know um, that we're, you know, we're in the curing barn, you know, we're, we're using those hardwoods, uh, but what happens next? What happens next to that leaf, man? Well, um, you know, that infuse, you know, the, when you go through the curing process, you know, it infuses that smokiness of the maple and the oak and the, um, and the hickory. And then, uh, we take it, like you said, we age it. Um, and when we take it and make it, put them into those cigars, man, it just, uh, it's, it's a magical thing. Um, you know, I, I was kind of thinking when Chris was talking and, and I'm, I'm kind of getting away from your question here, but you know, a lot of people have these fire cure cigars and they're like, well, that wasn't for me. I had it. I didn't like it. And I think a lot of that is just that people didn't pair it with the right drink. You know, fire cure by itself is, I don't think that's the way to experience a cigar. You have to have it with the, with the cocktail. You have to have it with a whiskey and these, uh, uh Isla scotches are one of the best ways to enjoy the cigar because, you know, you, you smell that cigar for the very first time. You're like, oh, my God, what is this? And um, and it tends to put you off. But like Chris, is, we were talking about earlier, is that, you know, this cigar smokes way different than it smells. You know, you get that. It's it's a lot more mellow. And when you when you pair it with that right whiskey and, and it kind of, you know, uh, you get the layers of that cigar. You get that um, you get the earthiness. You get the leather that's in that smoke. And. When you have this cigar with the right whiskey or the white right pairing, it completely changes the game on the cigar. The cigar is a phenomenal. It's I always say it's the best whiskey pairing cigar that we make. And I always uh, try to encourage people to try it with the whiskey. Go back at it. Ha- get your favorite whiskey, pour it, and then smoke the cigar and try it again. Because I think your opinion is going to be way, way, way different when you have it that way. 
Yeah, it's all how you approach it always. Yeah. And especially with something polarizing, it's what's your point of reference for smoke? You know, uh, and that's, that's, I guess, where it starts for anybody. What's your point of reference? Is smoke only because your house burned down and it's, it's a bad thing? Or is it, no, I like smoky barbecue. I like smoked ribs and brisket and butts and stuff. You know, if you have that, well, that's where you can say, hey, if you like that, this is the cigar equivalent. You know, so the headspace is set before you even try it. Because if you just try it blind, it's definitely aggressive. It's definitely like bang. You know, so it puts you back in your heels. So it's, it's like you said, just putting it in the right context with what you're pairing with it, uh, but also the expectations up front. It's, it's, hey, this is different. It says fire cured in the brand. So it's telling you something straight up. Right. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to say something. Go ahead, Cam. Oh, yeah. I was going to say something we often talk about is the, the genealogical link, you know, for, for human beings between like our evolution and fire, right? So anytime a, a brand speaks about uh, about the fire, there's there's a, an element of resonance that uh, you know that should resonate with us, you know, as as human beings. Um, fire is what allowed us to to start cooking our food um, as hunters and gatherers, which would allow us to start you know uh, absorbing enough proteins for our brains to start to develop, um, for our for our, our muscles to become strong enough to carry us upright which allowed our, our, our lungs to start to increase, our lung capacity to increase to allow us to run over longer distances. So, you know, fire has added so much to our, to humanity um, that deep down somewhere in our genetic code, there is a, a predisposition to the flavors that, you know, that in, inherently come with it. Um, you know, so to find sticks and sips that that angle at at that exact see i know i knew that I, i'm a professional i'm good at this i'm telling you to find sticks and, and sips that that both angle at that and, and evoke um and speak to that one human element and that is embedded into our genes uh is incredible yeah you're right um you're hey, just to go on top of that you talk about fire the communal aspect of fire what's more communal than a fire you can go out in a brand new place, not know anybody, just to build a fire. And before long, there's going to be eight people standing around the fire talking, right? Fire yeah. brings people together. It's a communal thing. And the culture of cigars, what is, I mean, we smoke cigars, but it's not just because we want to smoke a cigar. It's the communal aspect, the cultural aspect of it. So you're bringing in a culture, an entire industry, the cigar industry is based on people coming together and, 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 and talking and communing. And then now you're bringing in a cigar. You can't be more cigar than and more communal than than a fire cured cigar mm -hmm. and and a whiskey that is smoky and reminds you of that fire. So I mean, it, it like hits on all levels. I mean, it is like it's like it's like the building. It's so funny. It, nobody's done this before. But if you go back and you look, I mean, this is building block number one of the foundation of which of which the whole communal thing is built on. And, and we're just now experiencing rel relatively recently as, since this cigar came out. So I think, uh, and I guess probably that's enough of philosophy talk. So we'll kick it back over to you, Frank. Right, Chris, Chris uh, I'm gonna agree with you. First of all, neighbor's house caught fire. Everyone came out, you know, there was like about, you know, three or four fire trucks showed up and there was like 20 people like, you know, so, so yeah, dude, it was completely communal. Uh, that fire brought out everybody in the neighborhood uh i agree with you 100 percent cameron i'm gonna disagree with you uh i'm sure prometheus did not feel like you do uh that uh fire was such a great thing okay. uh but otherwise <laughs> on the human side yes yes uh fire is something i've always said fire and smoke is something that's ingrained in our for those of you that watch the water boy medulla oblongata it's part of our inner, thank you, Chris, for laughing. Uh, it's part of our inner sense and we're drawn to it. And, uh, and in regards to, to pairings, guys, you know, uh, you know, you've heard me talk over many, many episodes talking about reinforcement or contrast. Uh, here we're reinforcing, we're reinforcing the common elements uh, to create the perfect complement. So we're taking the reinforcement aspect. We're taking the smokiness of, of the whiskey and we're taking the smokiness of the cigar um, and we're combining those and we're reinforcing them, not one to overtake the other, but we're using both of them 
as as uh, to create that perfect complement. And this is a perfect opportunity. And I love the fact that we have uh, that we have such beautiful spirits that that convey that smokiness and uh, both on this on the stick side and on the sip side. Thank you very much, Jack. I get credit points. I know Cam's got some early points. Uh, you know, I get mine later. All right. So, uh, so yeah, listen, we're moving on. Uh, listen, it's Mescal Minute time. It is. You it know, is time. So, so all you guys want to talk about lactic acid and fucking dirt, dirty Tina's, you know, that's the, the, the fat wash, you know, the, for, never mind. I don't have time to explain. It's, it's the wood vat, you know, it's called the Tina in Spanish. And when it's dirty, it could, cr- create certain flavors don't worry about that all right so joey take it away my man <laughs> yeah i mean after you know what after drinking a, a dram of of this wee beastie which is super i mean it reminds me of when i first got into mezcal it's i think the first thing that draws you in is there's a, there is an element of smoke to it uh, but over the last several years for me that smokiness has disappeared like i don't taste smokiness in mezcal anymore at all i taste everything else now rises to the forefront so to smoke to drink the R bag is like, ah, there's that smoke. And I just did a, did a quick little uh, copita of, uh, this is a great starter. If you're going to start, this is a great one, you know, and you're going to get that wet, you know, those wet roots that, that Cam spoke about earlier, that wet, smoky kind of dank roots. And that's part, that's only part of it, but that that's the hook. That's the hook that hooks you, right? And then you get all these other wonderful, you know, herbal, you know, fruit that come up behind it and that sweetness. And it's just super yummy. You, you know, 70 some odd episodes in, you hear me talking about it. It's, and it, it makes for a great pairing with a cigar, any cigar. And uh, cheers to Ron cheers Cooper. To, cheers to Ron Cooper. And, and, and to the little clay copita glass, because you need this. There, there you go. There. <laughs> Slanja, even though they wouldn't say that in Mexico, but Slanja. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they say it somewhere. If there's anyone who says it, it's Ulysses. Uh, Anyway, if they say, fuck you all, you know, (laughs) it's like, coño, yeah, pincho gringo. Uh, Anyway, so (laughs) listen, we got to the great point in the show where we got the ask Frankie drinks. uh, So five questions that we've chosen. So wait, 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 what happened? This is a big day, man. There's, there's, there's like birthdays and stuff, man. Oh, sh- oh yeah. Man. Oh, yeah, shit. absolutely. So uh, do you want to do them or I want to do them? I'll do one. And you do okay, the other. do one. I'll All do right. the other. All right. So uh, the guy that keeps me in line in doing what I do at Drew Estate is uh, Henry. Everybody knows Henry from Cigar Safari. If you don't, uh, you got to meet him. He's just a beautiful, magical person. Uh, and, and, and just an incredible friend and, and someone I get to work with every single day. So uh, happy birthday to Henry. I love you, man. It's for you. Cheers, Slancha. Slancha to Henry, to, to the guy that smelled our mezcal mm. and said, Yuck. something died in there. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I appreciate that because, uh, you know, that's right. really what we wanted. And yep. he was right. Yes. And I'm going to raise a glass to our master blender. Uh, for Drew Estate, Mr. Willie Herrera, today's yeah. birthday. Uh, you know, he's the guy that comes up with all the blends, and and that's such an amazing uh, thing for us. And we celebrate Willie. Uh, this is Willie Wednesday, and uh, there you go, dude. His his focus thing is like dope, Jack. Yeah, why can't I get that? You know that super. Yeah, we all need that thing. when we hang it up to the front. Yeah, you- like yo, this is like not cool. That's uh, next level. <laughs> Yeah, it's next level. Exactly. So, uh, you know, so happy birthday. And last week happy was birthday. Robin. So shout out to Robin. Uh, happy birthday to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, can, I got to do one more. I got to do one more. My buddy, Chris Lober, who watches every week and he screenshots me as I'm taking a drink and he sends it to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we really want to drink to this dude? Yeah, let's drink to him too, the bastard that he is. So. Yeah, all right. Yeah, well, all right. Just your bastard you know? friends that tell on you all the time. So, yeah. I hate those guys. Anyway, so uh, my wife doesn't even know I'm on freaking Facebook. So eh. anyway, so uh, Christine Cologne Clark, um, what is she asks? uh, What is the best cigar for a newbie that wants to explore cigars that are not infused or sweet? So I'm going to throw that over to Chris Brower. What do you think? Where do they go? Start with the Undercrown Shade, man. 
it, it just it's got enough uh you know it's got enough ass to it to stand up to a lot of stuff it's it, you know that was really my um cigar that brought me into shade because for a long time before having that cigar i didn't enjoy shit i just thought there was nothing there it was air there wasn't much to the cigar i was like what's the point of this but after smoking that underground shade that that is a great cigar to bring uh new cigar smokers into that want to go with a traditional cigar go and not go with an infuse it, it, it's a phenomenal smoke that's one of my everyday cigars and, 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 and i know that's with a lot of drew estate people that's the same smoke the same thing yeah. Yeah, I, I agree on that. But also the, the Underground Maduro as well. And, and a lot of people think that, oh, Maduro means it's strong. The darker cigar means it must be strong. And that's totally not the case. Uh, they're, so, they're very approachable, super flavorful. So try both the shade and the Maduro. And, and that'll get you, you know, that'll get you on your path to success and, and, and making friends. All right. So I'm going to twist the question a bit. So Cameron uh a newbie to isla peated whiskeys where do they start oh 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 um i think that you start with ardbeg tenya uh you know that that whiskey builds context for all of the other whiskeys within the core range um, of ardbeg i think that we at Ardbeg make the most complex set of core range whiskeys of, of any distillery on the island. Um, but to, to really start to understand why each of them is individually stunning, uh, you need to build context. Uh, and the best way to do that is by getting to know the distillery by you know, uh, essentially having the tenure uh, because there is some whiskey of that style um, that goes into each of the other expressions. Uh, so our big 10 for me is just the best way to get and understand the distillery's thumbprint and DNA. So start with the 10 for sure. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, next question. I've got Tyler Smith asked Frankie drinks. I am new to whiskey. I noticed some bottles say non chill filtered. What does that mean? And how does that impact flavor? So I'm going to, I'm going to give it to our whiskey guy. Uh, Cam, do you mind answering that question? What does uh, non-chill filtered mean? There you go. <laughs> All right, let's do this. <laughs> right. So um, yeah. non-chill filtration is one of my favorite things about, about Ardbeg. Um, anytime you see a whiskey that's bottled below uh, about 45.8, but call it 46%, you're able to take an educated guess that that whiskey is non-chill -fil non filtered. Um, anytime you see a whiskey above that, above that, that mark, anytime you see a whiskey that's below that, you'll know that that whiskey has more than likely been chill filtered. Whiskey is a solution. Uh, and because of that, there are different um, esters, there are different lipids, there are different uh, organic compounds that exist in this solution. So below 46% alcohol by volume, if there's temperature fluctuation, if that bottle gets too hot or too cold, some of the things within that solution may come out of solution. And that's called flocculation to throw another fancy $10 word into the mix here today, right? So that will result in there being like flakes or specks or solids in the whiskey. So to, to you know, kind of uh, defeat this, anytime you see a whiskey bottled below 46%, uh, you know that, that it's been chill, chill filtered. So what that's doing is it's removing um, lipids and fats, right? I think that fats are a net positive in the whiskey drinking experience. Remember, we're not only looking for aroma and taste, but also how it feels. And so some of that lipid kind of um, presence is important for how a whiskey will feel when you're drinking it. So for ard bags, each ard bag is bottled above 46% alcohol by volume. We don't add any colors to it. And we definitely don't chill filter because we want you to feel all of the, um, the lipids and, and all of the, the sensations that come with pouring a lovely dram of ard bag. That's because he's, he's so, anti-viscosity is the word he didn't want to say. Exactly. That's yeah, another right, right. off word. Viscosity is gone. Exactly. So, right. 
Terroir, Terroir is gone, gone you know. Right. So, uh, you know, so everybody, Tyler Smith, congratulate. That was a great question. You know, I would just say, don't go flocculate yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> pick pick something above forty six ABV. Uh, next uh, next Mother question. Flocker. Mother flocker. Mother. F- <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Mark Burke asks, ask the wizard, when does Joey get Mescal Minute swag? Ooh, wow. You're the first person to even ask that. And maybe we'll make some for you. Maybe I'll make one piece of swag. And then in an episode down the road, I will, we will pick you again for a winner. And we will give you that swag. Mescal Minute swag. Oh, well, I have to talk right. to you. Uh, in in the meantime, team. Mark, you got you got to slum it with the sticks and sips yeah, swag, slum. you know, uh, until we get Mescal Minute swag. And, and we'll, you know, maybe we'll get like an Arbeg 30 seconds later on, uh, you know, if Cam wants to come back. And, you know, he's always welcome to join us. Uh, so what? All right. This is it. This 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 may be one of the, the questions we were waiting for all night. Will Kulisiansky right uh ask what kicks is cam wearing for sticks and sips oh my goodness all right well you know what right now i'm barefoot because i'm in my office but you're gonna make me pull out what i was wearing earlier today God, man come on how are you gonna do put it, me on the do screen it. like this so we're, we're gonna co- wait, go go get this go get okay. the kicks because will will's gonna get his swag and we're gonna take the next question and uh you know i'm gonna ask this one uh dina fasano congratulations you win uh question is does the type of glass make a difference in the experience of taste or smell i'm gonna give that one to chris gwaltney mr gwaltney chris what do you think man you you know i used to think that uh glassware didn't matter i mean obviously you know we're drinking whiskey out of this and 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 the glass shape has had some impact on how much alcohol you're getting in when you you know you're, you stick, you don't want to stick your nose in there like you're like you're drinking wine because you're just going to get alcohol. I but I used to think that glasses didn't matter until like a year ago someone from Riddell came in and did a presentation and they had all these different glasses and Riddell actually makes a Coke glass for drinking Coca Cola out of, and they poured it in this glass and the gla- I don't it's some kind of voodoo magic. But it is the greatest Coke I have ever drank in my life. The foam stayed in the glass. So glass does matter. Um, but, you know, I mean, if you don't have a glass, you know, you can always go old school. Yeah, like Will McFall. That's a Will McFall hey, move right you know, there. I, yeah, so that's the, my boy Will. I want to this, give a shout out to him. So, this is a glass. Just yeah, for everybody, this is a glass. Technically, it's a glass. It's but, the most elaborate glass that Arbeg has produced for us to be able to grab their bottle with the beautiful, uh, you know, little neck nubs, you know, so you can get your, your three fingers on that and you can pour it nicely and you can hold it label out. Uh, Cam, this is for you, man. Label out yeah. always. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and that we can enjoy it. Uh, but you know, listen, in absence of the appropriate glass, uh, Oh, you mean this one? Parents, yeah, yeah that's the that's the one oh, that's a beautiful beautiful coupe yeah uh, beautiful coupe glass of a of a bloody rob roy i wonder how i got it yeah there you go uh cam do you have any thoughts on glassware mm, yeah um glassware is very important i generally try to when i'm in enjoying whiskeys uh singularly by themselves i'll try to find something in, in the shape of uh, the glen karen glass or at least something that has a slightly tapered like nose that way, when I kind of dig my nose, uh, not even dig my nose down into it, when I when I wave it kind of and do like a, a drive by, if you will, um, uh, of my my olfactory system, I'm still not losing or missing any of the, you know, any of the the organic compounds that are coming out of solution. So you want a tapered glass that keeps most of these things trapped in the glass so that you can still experience them. If you're using like a, a wide rocks glass. Um, you know, a lot of those, uh, a lot of the more volatile elements are going to dissipate really, really quickly. If you can keep them in solution or at least in, uh, in the vessel a little bit longer by tapering, uh, by tapering the, the actual lips of the glass, you're going to have a, a, an experience that, that is, you know, that is better. Glass absolutely matters when you're drinking whiskeys, for sure, or just spirits in, uh, in general. 
And uh, shout out to Richard Patterson, who has a specific way of doing things. Hello, mm -hmm. how are you? And all those beautiful things that, that he does, and uh, but they are effective. And uh, Dina, that was a great question. And now we're going to go back to Will Kulisenki's question. What were the kicks tonight? Yeah. So when I left my house, the one time that I left my house earlier today was, was to run down to the grocery store. Um, and I had to put on one of my favorite, one of my absolute favorites, Jordan. This one is my Jordan ones. Um, I own a lot of different pairs of Jordan ones, but this colorway I absolutely love, obviously, because oh, it is yeah. basically wee beastie, wee beastie colors. Uh, so love this it. is what I put on when I went down to the QFC earlier <laughs> today. Um, I do wear most of my shoes. Uh, I just make sure I clean them and put them back in the boxes after i wear them i'm obsessed there you go you know listen we're gonna have a we're gonna have a sticks and uh kicks. sticks and kicks episode coming up Love in it. april with uh my man jake uh den denklifts so uh you know who customizes his own shoes so uh man you may you may want to jump on brother i'm gonna need to join I'm, I'm gonna need to learn some some of his ways my my custom ones that i've tried to to paint I've been terrible because I, I have the artistic vision of a third grader um, and, and the sense of humor of one too as well. <laughs> but, but for sure, I'd love, I'd love to learn a little bit more. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, listen, I think we, we finally gotten to the end of the episode. So uh, listen, I'm gonna say uh, thank you to all of you, uh, Chris Brower, Chris Gwaltney, uh, Cameron, my man, Joey, uh, for being part of Sticks and Sips, uh, our, our, our beautiful Drew Estate virtual happy hour. Congratulations to all the winners. Uh, I'm going to say, listen, uh, we, a little support here uh, for the people in, uh, in hospitality and our brick and mortar shops. Uh, please support them. I know we're, you know, things are changing rapidly, uh, but we've had an entire year. Uh, it's incredible. It's an entire year of, of people in different areas really going through really tough times. So uh, please support your, your hospitality professionals when and where you can. Um, they're there for you and they're going to be there for you when we come out of this. So, so help them out, uh, support your brick and mortar shops uh, all the way from the small guys, all the way to guys like the humidor at ABC. These guys are there to service you and uh and there to help you get your cigars and uh with that make sure you follow uh drew estate cigar you can follow me at frankie underscore drinks you can art bag cam right at art bag cam there you go sure, uh sure. you know you got you know you got joey drew you know where to find him and you know and drew estate brower chris drew estate chris and humidor chris and all you guys and uh thanks to all of you guys you know listen this is it. Listen, the bar's closed. Make sure you tip. You tip well, right? You know, uh, and uh, above all things, tune in next week because you know what? It's next week is St. Patrick's Day. So uh, we're going to keep celebrating uh, with some Irish stuff. So what can I tell you guys? Uh, thank you for tuning in. Jack, thank you for being an amazing producer. I almost knocked over the mic. It's all good. Thank you for tuning in. Six and six. We're out. Bars closed. Good riddance.